This is a version of the same presentation I gave uh, earlier this year at the Western Pavement Preservation Partnership meeting in uh, Traverse City. And we try to each year over the last few years come out to the regional partnerships and update on where we're at with this effort uh, from a high level, as Gary mentioned, basically is founded to put together more national type specifications for pavement preservation treatments similar to what the hot mix industry has for, for hot binders uh, and their products. In general, this particular group was originally formed 2008, 2009, but essentially when Jim Sorensen was still alive and running the, the Office of Asset Management in Washington, D.C., there was a meeting that happened around one of the asphalt emulsion industry sessions, EMA, one of the annual EMA ARAS meetings, and there was a group of practitioners and stakeholders that got together and Jim organized and said, hey, you know, what we really need to do is start working on some more standardized specifications for these pavement preservation treatments because now we have lots of different specifications for chip seals, micro slurry, et cetera, depending on what state you're in, what county you're in. Different cities and different states have the same thing. If you, if you go now to the Asphalt Institute website, they actually have an emulsion spec database there on top of the, the PG spec database. And if you go look at the hot mix binders that are PG graded, you'll see that there are some variations, but obviously the PG system is fairly standardized. So from state to state, for the most part, you'll see similarities. And the specs are usually a couple pages for all of their binders for hot mix. And then if you go to that same state and you look at the emulsion specifications, you might find that it's 15 pages and there's 17 different emulsion treatments and the naming, the nomenclature is different. And if you go to the next state over, there is nine pages and they have different nomenclature for the same products. I mean, quite frankly, it just doesn't make sense that that would be the case, but that's where we were. From that, basically, Jim said, hey, you know, we need to try to standardize this because from an agency perspective, agencies feel really comfortable with Ashto. I mean, if you come with an Ashto spec and you're talking to a road owner or an agency, you know, okay, it's Ashto, it's been vetted by all 50 states, voted on. There's a, there's a level of confidence and, and, and um, familiarness and, and comfort with, with that particular type of specification. And with few exceptions, we didn't really have a lot of ASHTO specs for emulsion treatments out there. From that perspective, this, con this meeting happened in 2009. Jim organized this first meeting of the ETF back in 2009, I think it was. And basically, the group was formed under the Payment Preservation Expert Task Group. So it was under FHWA. The ETF would meet at the PPETG meetings. The original mandate, again, as we discussed, was develop national span standards for emulsion treatments, you know, performance-based specification, uniform standards, okay? So this, this, this hits what the original mandate was. To make a long story as short as I can, the group met from 2009 through 2011. And there was some work done. In particular, one of the first issues that was tackled was with emulsion treatments as opposed to hot binders, we, and this has a lot to do with production, and, and there are a lot of emulsion producers here, so you're familiar with this and how the processes work at the various terminals and plants, is we use a high temperature recovery procedure. So right out of the chute, before you do anything, you immediately submit this material to a process and a treatment and a temperature that it will never ever see. One of the first initiatives that we tackled was way back in from 2009 to 11 was low temperature recovery. And now there are ASTM and ASHTO standards in place for low temperature recovery. We've been working with what is, was originally referred to as the Texas method, which came out of Darren Hazlitt's group and TexDOT and TTI, which basically you take the emulsion and you treat it at 60 degrees C in a thin film for 60 hours, and then you, you, you uh, run tests on that, whatever, whatever you want to specify. It's naturally geared towards smaller samples that you would run on a DSR, right? So the other piece of this really is getting away from empirical standards, moving to low temperature recovery, smaller sample sizes, but running on something like a DSR, whatever that looks like. And we'll get to what we think that may look like at the end of the presentation. So out of that whole effort, really what came in the first couple years was a ASHTO standard for low temperature recovery. There was some other work done, but it, that's the big highlight from that period of time. And then in 2011, in between, Jim Sorensen passed away, and then there was a lot of reorganization that happened within uh, Washington, D.C. at the Office of Asset Management. And essentially, 
the group kind of went on hiatus with the PPETG from 2011 to about 2013. And so not much happened. We weren't really sure what was going to happen. I'm not sure who decided that we wanted to reinstitute or reconstitute this group, but somewhere Larry and others decided, hey, let's, let's meet again and see if we can get this effort revived in 2013. And so there was a meeting in July of uh, 2013 up at Rhode Island, and Colin Franco has been the chairman of this group. I don't know if anybody in here knows Colin, but he's uh, one of the head materials uh, personnel at the Rhode Island DOT, very active in Ashto, very, very well respected and connected. And so we had the meeting up at the Rhode Island DOT offices and essentially kind of got the effort going again. Uh, we were still at that time under the, the PPETG, but even then the PPETG was still kind of in limbo after all the reorganization and what was going on in DC. We spent the first six months basically trying to figure out how to get all of the stakeholders involved in this particular effort so that we could build consensus as we worked on these standards, all right? So there was a lot of effort put into who needs to be involved in this because you, you got to have the right people. And within the emulsion industry, it's fairly, it's a little fragmented. There's different industry groups and different various stakeholders. So what we came up with was, you know, like a basically roughly a 30 membership group and with stakeholders taken from all the various uh, important groups that operate in the industry, emulsion producer, contractors, Asphalt Institute, FP Squared, NCPP, EMA, ARA, ISA, to try to get everybody, everybody's voice heard because as everybody knows, material specs are a pretty touchy subject. It's not the easiest thing to do, not to mention the fact everybody's working pretty much pro bono with, with the exception of some invitational travel money that, uh, you know, we, we uh, were able to secure for academic folks and the agency folks from the feds. Basically now we have what's called the, you know, we have members, friends, and experts, but essentially there's about 30 members, a bunch of friends. And what we also did is we decided we needed to, to kind of subdivide what we were doing, all right? So basically we have some subcommittees within all these members and friends, and these, each of the, of the member groups, uh, people that are that our members are very actively involved in the subcommittees. We broke down into these groups, you can read, in residue recovery and testing. Arliss from BASF, he's actually an EMA representative slot. He heads that group. Gary mentioned, he's, and, and Jim Multhrop, I don't know if Jim's here. They're the co-chairs of the, of the spray group emulsion, spray, group, spray, spray emulsion group, the mix emulsion group. Larry uh, and Todd Shields from, in, from uh, in, that's, that should say Indiana DOT, Indiana DOT on uh, QCQA, supplier certification. Larry's gonna talk about that later. Recycling emulsions, we set off separate. Uh, Darren actually is retired from TechStop, and Jerry Peterson from TechStop's taken over for Darren in the research group. And then we have another group down here, basically, which has to do with um, the material, the actual emulsion specs, and what we're gonna talk about at the end of this about surface performance grading of emulsion residues that coordinates with each of these groups. So there was a lot of, work done the first six months, 12 months from 2013 to 14 to get everything set up, organized, get stakeholders involved, get the subcommittee set up, get work rolling to try to actually move from just, you know, looking at low temperature recovery to actually generating ashto based specifications and practices to submit, you know, to the subcommittee on materials to be voted on and potentially approved and published. We also at, this, at that time in 2013 came up with kind of a list of treatments that we wanted to treat. Not surprisingly, the first two as they tend to be, um, if, you dis, if you take tack coat out of the equation in terms of volume, chip seal and microsurfacing are the two largest volume emulsions that are placed. So that became kind of the two test cases for generating these ASHTO type standards and documents and practices. And then you can see the rest of the list here. And I'll get to this just in a minute, but basically we've covered chip seal, micro tack, fog scrub, sand, slurry seal, um, cold in place recycling. We've got most of these on this list are either at the subcommittee on materials, tech section 2A or the full subcommittee on materials for voting, have been approved and or have been published. Between 2013 and you know kind of being reconstituted, re-energized, redefining the mission, reorganizing our membership and the subcommittee groups. Now, as of 2016, um, uh, we now have emulsion treatment standards for micro and chip seal have been published. So they're out there. I don't know if anybody's seen them yet or if there are any agencies here, state or local, that use 
have, have used or seen these, but essentially how it works in Ashto, and this was a, an education for me, is you have material specifications and design practices. Your design practice references a material spec. So this is kind of how it works within Ashto. So you have to have both documents. So initially, where we're trying to get to is a national standard like a surface performance grading, a PG type system maybe for emulsions. But initially, to get started within Ashto, what we decided was there are currently specs out there. There's M140, M208, and M316. And M140 is the specification for anionic emulsions, 208 is cationic, and then 316 was polymer modified cationic. Rather than try to get provisional specs in new specifications, what we decided to do was break this down into two phases. So phase one was update M140, 208, and 316, and then get the design practices in for all the treatments for chip seal micro, et cetera, and reference the updated ASHTO specs that were out there. A lot of work went into this, but basically now what we've done, these were all updated and published in, in September. The Ashto books get published like August, September of each year. So in 2016, there's a new 140, 208, and 316. These don't have low temperature recovery in there yet. It's still high temperature recovery of the emulsion residues, which from a, you know, from an emulsion, from a production perspective is somewhat favored because of the timing and having to turn tanks and the number of products that are made. But what we did do, the other thing we looked at was, in addition to low temperature recovery, the other thing we suffer from in our industry is that relative to hot mix is this temperature susceptibility of the binder is not included in, in the material spec. So if you look at a chip seal spec, let's say, it'll have a pin range of 90 to 250. And if you look at LTPP bind and all the work that happened with SuperPave, that's doesn't th that doesn't really technically make much sense that you would have a spec that would allow basically a, either a PG minus 34 or a PG minus 22 binder being used in the same area for the same application independent of climate or traffic or anything. If you look now at these specs, they all have at least a pin range. There's different pin ranges. There's a soft range, a standard range, and a hard range. That was the other adjustment we wanted to make when we updated these material specs was we needed to get temperature susceptibility in there as a precursor to moving to something where you would grade like we do on a PG scale. So you'll notice that all these now, if you look at them or you've used them before, there's not just a CRS2 spec. There's a CRS2S spec, a CRS2, and CRS2H which loosely correlates to, I think it's, the H is 40 to 90, it goes 90 to 150 and 150 to 250. And that, those ranges were determined from some work that Gail King did for the Federal Highway Lands Group, where he correlated pin ranges to PG grades. So this is, you know, kind of part of phase, phase one. So we got temperature susceptibility in, we got a low temperature recovery method in Ashto. So the other piece of this was, for 316, it didn't include, th there was no microsurfacing emulsion in Ashto specifications anywhere until this, right? It was only in the ISSA guidelines. So now if you look at M316, you actually have polymer modified and, and, and micro out there. So there's a spec table for, for modified micro, there's a spec table for modified tack coach, which some stakes are using. So basically, we brought all these specifications up to today for high temperature recovered residues with temperature susceptibility included with pin ranges. So if you're in Minnesota, you might use CRS2S, but if you're in Texas, you might use CRS2H versus having one spec for the same. The second piece of this then was you develop these design practices for each of the treatments, and now they reference back. So now within Gary and Jim's group, they came up with the design practice documents like that you have for the hot mix industry for these treatments and they would reference, they would say, you know, microsurfacing, choose your microsurfacing emulsion from table X in Ashto M316. So you reference back to M316 or 140 or 208 that have now been updated and then use this design practice. And these documents are pretty, these practices are fairly short. They're a couple pages, something like that. We don't need to get too much into this, but then also within Ashto, you have these things called construction guide specs and best practices documents. We've worked on some of these as well, but there's a little bit of where do you publish these. For the guide specs, we've done some work with NCHRP research submittals. 
best practices, you know, we're talking about tech briefs maybe within FHWA or AASHTO, but the big piece of this, at least initially, was just getting these treatments into AASHTO, updating the material specs, and getting the standards standardized through the subcommittee on materials. So now for microservicing and chip seal, there's a design practice and an updated material spec in M316. The other thing about M316 that we did, because there are some states that use M316, is it had different types of polymer systems separate. So if you were using this modifier or that modifier, you would have a different specification. The new spec is all one. There doesn't specify, because you can't really talk about performance-based specs and say, oh, you're, you know, for this you do this, and for, th for this system it should be graded this way. It needs to be a uniform grading system. That was another big change that you'll see. You don't have two columns for this modifier or that modifier. They're all the same, and there's one specification for plus testing. As a polymer person, having worked with polymers over the year, the one thing you'll notice in material specifications for both hot mix and emulsion is the, the plus specifications that are usually used, elastic recovery, TNT, ductility, torsional recovery, force ductility, there's about, I don't know, 500 of them. A classic one is ER. If, if that's the other thing, even if you look at the hot mix specs under AASHTO M320, there's about seven different ways to run an ER on original or RTFO binder. And all these specs are designed to say, really, fundamentally, is there polymer there and how much? You can actually do that in one test, if that's really what the objective is. <laughs> you don't need seven different ones for the polymers, because those tests really are specific to the type of polymer, its structure, molecular weight, and all that. If you look at M316 now, it has one basic test that any polymer would pass at a given loading level. In progress here, um, within the subcommittee, and on this, real quick on the subcommittee on materials, you start off in tech section 2A or 5B now, depending on what the treatment is and then you have to pass through the tech section before you get to a full subcommittee on materials ballot. So this is a real, it takes about a year if everything goes well from submittal to publication if you, everything goes smoothly, okay? Right now we have tack coat, scrub seal, sand seal. Yeah, oh yeah, cold in place. Slurry seal and fog seals, these are gonna be published in 2017. We got them through. Cold in place recycling is going to be published in 2017. So then we'll have design practices and the updated material specs for micro, chip seal, slurry seal, fog seal, cold in place recycling. And then now these, um, these three treatments here, full depth reclamation is still in process, but these three for tack coat, scrub, and sand are now with the tech section and going to full, they'll, they probably will make it on 2018. All that being said, so we've done a lot of work between 2013 and 16 to get up to speed. We've updated the material specs. We've got a low temperature recovery method in AASHTO. We have temperature susceptibility in the existing AASHTO material specs. And now we have design practices for all these treatments that have never been in AASHTO before. Phase one is kind of coming to a close. So over the last year, we've transitioned into phase two, which is basically this. Now we want to get into the actual development of a more of a performance graded specification for the residues, which is accompanied by low temperature recovery. So in theory, what you want to do is recover the emulsion at the temperature at which it would be exposed to in the field, which is roughly 140 Fahrenheit is not a bad estimation, and then take that low temperature material and test it on something like a DSR, where it doesn't have to be retreated, reheated, and poured, and, and modified. The other piece that we're working on, and, Gary, and Larry will talk about this too, is supplier certification and quality assurance. And, you know, Gary made this point, too, that um, a lot of the issues that we have with treatments in the field are, can be traced to construction, workmanship, application, and that's, that's true. So you have to have a parallel effort going on while you're trying to upgrade the material specs and the practices with the actual contractor piece of this. These two pieces are what we're really working on now. We've got a, we have two meetings a year now. And also something I should mention too is that we are now the AASHTO TSB2. Two years, has it been two years? My God. Two, two years uh, now. We, we, we basically reorganized from FHWA PPETG under the AASHTO TSB2 program, much like the Pavement Preservation Partnerships are organized now. So we have state funding for for our invitational meetings. We have two in-person meetings a year and the rest of the time the meetings happen by, you know, phone calls and, and uh, conference calls, that kind of thing within the subcommittees. So we have an upcoming 
meeting and one in uh, in our late or we have usually in June and one in November December we have one coming up at the end of November the big focus of that is going to be this SPG we're call we call it SPG which basically means emulsion residue graded according to a PG type system we've been working on this for a year we actually have have contracted through the Asphalt Institute this summer we have a we had a round, kind of a round robin program with some industrial labs to gather emulsions to be recovered by low temperature and then tested according to rheological tests as opposed to more of the empirical tests that are still used today like pen and softening point and ER and these kinds of things. Mike Voth, who I mentioned earlier, he, he was the, the person that kind of handled the M140, 208, and 316 chairing that effort to get them upgraded and then he's been in charge of this effort working with Gail King who's retired. Um, many of you here I'm sure know Gail. Basically what you have now is there's been a lot of research that's been done and reported on, and some of you, I'm sure, have seen the NCHRP reports. Dr. Kim finished uh, nine, his 9-50 project and published a, a full report on that, which has some recommendations. Darren Hazlitt and Amy Epps are involved in our group. Dr. Kim, Dr. Ha uh, uh, Darren, until he retired, and Dr. Epps, they're members of our group and actually are members of this subcommittee working on this. So the idea here is to take what we have now for the state of the research practice and then condense that down into a single you know table or specification for that you would now use instead of ashto m140 208 or 316 now where this would go is you go back and you put in a new table that's provisional table xx dash whatever and now your chip seal your microservicing your tack coat your fog seal your slurry seal cold in place recycling etc they all reference a new material specification once it's developed and approved. But this new table then would be low temperature recovery grading like you would performance graded systems. So they're looking at a, these samples that were part of this round robin program are looking at some of the new rheological tests that have been developed in some of these studies to validate. That will be reported on at our meeting like some of the, the research that's just been done most recently. Um, by the labs. I think it was you know, Husky uh, Materials has done some testing, Ergon Paragon's lab's done some testing, Matthew Construction's done some testing, Mike Anderson again in AI has kind of been contracted out uh, to oversee the project and gather the data and monitor the samples. So there's a lot of work ongoing in this area, you know, so hope we're hopeful to see, to see some p positive results at the meeting in November. But the idea then would be by next year we're putting together a table and submitting it to the ASHTO subcommittee on materials tech section 2A for consideration as a provisional practice to, that would replace 140, 208, and 316 potentially going forward. Okay, so there's a whole whole process strategy that's been involved with this from the, from the start. That pretty much covers it. I mean, the strategy, I know there was a lot of details in there about ASHTO, but the thing is, is that ASHTO is a lot of work and it's, it's a very structured process and you have to go through a very particular procedures on all the standards and practices and everything. They get vetted by all 50 states. You get a lot of comments. We've spent a lot of time going back to individual agency reps at states that have said, you know, I have a comment about this. Can you address this? So, you know, once you get to the point where you publish it, it's time for a beer or five. We've made a lot of progress and honestly speaking with, you know, not a lot of funding. Um, you know, it's not like we're the hot mix industry where you're getting NCHRP research proposals for four or five million dollars. You know, we're lucky if we can get something through and get a few hundred thousand dollars, you know, to do work. Where we're at now with where we were th just three years ago is a we've come a long way. And in particular, I got calls this year. Just the change to M316 alone, forgetting about the design practice stuff, that was a big deal, you know, for, these, for the states that use M316. This is, it's being noticed and it's being adopted out there now. So we'll just see where we, where we go from here. But ultimately this surface performance grading piece is where we wanted to get to. That was the original objective. How many more years do we have with TSP2? Another year or two? We have until 19 where we've been approved for funding for the ETF, for our invitational travelers, the agency reps and the academic reps. And I think we're gonna be hopefully pretty close to where we need to be by then hopefully with the subcommittee on materials and we'll have a provisional surface performance grading standard in place and that will get us pretty close to what the original vision of Jim Sorensen was back in 2009. A volunteer army and 
limited funding is, I think, is a pretty good accomplishment. That one uh, comment that you made about, again, whether or not there's polymer or not polymer is something that uh, a lot, I think a lot of agencies who buy a lot of microsurfacing and that type of thing, that's one of the things that they wrestle with. And anyhow, in our agency, we've just we've kind of gone with the rain ball test, which is just whether it's a go or no go. And I uh, just like your thoughts on that as a way of uh, identifying that. That's kind of the, the ring, the softening point for microsurfacing residues recovered by high temperature has been kind of a the plus, what we would call from the hot mix side, the plus test to determine polymer presence and loading level. So what you're doing today is, is it would be the standard. And in the updated uh, specification for Ashto M316 that now has a spec for CQS 1P and CQS 1HP. So there's a spec for like 90 to 200 pin residue and then there's a spec for 40 to 90 residue, which is your standard CQS one, it's called one HP in this designation, but that's your standard system. It has this, like the softening point of 135-ish. From my experience working with these polymer systems, that'll tell you, yep, I got about 3% in there and I'm meeting the minimum requirement. According to the ISSA guidelines, it's you know a minimum 3% rubber solids on asphalt. So you, the key is, you know, how do you prove that it's there, even though you've written in there, this is the minimum that you want. But that, that's pretty, it's actually a pretty good indicator. Going forward, what we would have is something, hopefully, that would be more based on DSR measurements like G star over sine delta, a phase angle, something from the new Ashto M332 testing for J and R percent recovery. That's where this is heading, ultimately, to get away from these empirical tests. Plus, the other thing you have to remember is that in emulsions, you have two different types of modification for polymer systems. You have the water phase modification with latex polymers, which form a continuous film in the water phase, at, you know, and then you have solid polymer additives, which go into the asphalt before it's emulsified. On the hot mix side, when PG was adopted, you know, when you modify hot mix asphalt, everything goes into the binder you have one specification no matter what modifier you use because it's all modifying the asphalt and you test it one way. But for emulsions now, it's, it's a little counterintuitive because in, in phase one of our work, we took M316, which said, if you use this modifier or this modifier, let's put it into one table and have one test. If you recover the residue at high temperature, you can do that. Now, if you go to this phase two where you're trying to do performance grading on the DSR and you recover at low temperature, then that changes the equipment. You, you may have to go back out in, the, in this system and have, if I am using this polymer system recovered at low temperature that's outside the droplet for latex systems, I'm going to test this way to make sure. I may have a different DSR test for system A versus system B, and for a low temperature recovered residue for these systems, that's okay. It's okay to be different under these technical conditions because it makes sense. In the old system, it did not make sense when you're recovering everything at high temperature to have a proliferation of a bunch of different tests designed to tell you, do I have 3% of this class or not? Just from my perspective, I mean, this work is just awesome. That's and the progress that you've made on this, but in terms of softening point and local agencies and having something that your neighborhood lab can do to kind of determine whether or not you're getting what you're paying for and that all the contractors on are on the level playing field with each other sure. is a very critical. Now, there is a piece of this as to the, you know, it's come up in our group about, okay, what, you know, what about most, most production facilities in general, now this isn't 100%, but most have a, a DSR in most cases. You can get a DSR for a fairly reasonable price nowadays. It's not like when they first came out when you, you know, I remember managing a lab 15 years ago and it was, new DSR was $80,000, you know. So you were out looking for a demo model that was at Best Buy on the floor. You can, you can, that is an issue, like the equipment piece, but we kind of felt like on the high temperature side, getting a reasonably priced, even a demo or a slightly used rheometer if somebody didn't have one, it's not onerous, you just need air, you know, clean air to run and a hood. And, you know, if you're doing distillations, you got a hood and, ut and, and utilities coming in 
there. Now on the low temperature side, that's different. The whole peat, we haven't talked at all about what about the low temperature side of things? Because if you recover the emulsion at low temperature and you got this thin film, okay, by the hot mix standards, you RTFO the binder, then you pour PAV pans, then you run it through the PAV, then you get BBR beams and you run on the BBR. This requires a bunch of temperature treatments and we're trying to get away from artificially treating the residue at higher temperatures than it's exposed to. To, to more accurately model the field conditions. You'll see from this research that comes out from the stuff we're doing, there's a little bit of work looking at four millimeter DSR and some other kind of surrogates for low temperature. However, that's my personal opinion is that's gonna be, you know, a long way down the road. If we can just get to looking at, you know, high temperature properties even on the DSR, then we've come a tremendous distance and we can close that gap you know, when we're comfortable with the statistics and the tests and that kind of thing. Thanks. Thank you. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.